Hello, this is Dr. Ford Brewer with state-of-the-art heart attack, stroke, and cancer prevention. This video is an overview of cardiogenetics. We've done several videos on specific topics within cardiogenetics. We'll just uh, overview and review them briefly. First of all, what is cardiogenetics? And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the basic uh, generic genetic concepts. Then we'll review the, the specific topics. Um, it's Cardiogenetics is what it says. Again, it's another, another one of those medical science words where they put two words together. Cardio means heart and genetics, well, you know what that means. So this is the, uh, the science in the area where we look at the genetics associated with heart attack and stroke prevention. Uh, there's a lot known out there. We're learning tons and tons more every year. Uh, this area of medicines being rewritten, just like high blood pressure management and others, are being rewritten because of genetics. Now, <clears throat> uh, we just covered a few items because we're focusing on the items that can make a practical difference to you on a daily basis in terms of heart attack and stroke prevention. Now, I mentioned uh, technical stuff. Just a couple of quick terms. We mentioned alleles a few times. Allele, an allele is a copy of a gene. Remember, you get one uh, copy from your mom and one allele from your dad for each gene. Just like you have two chromosomes, um, two copies of the, each of the 23 chromosomes. And um, if you have the same copy, the same allele from your mom that you got from your dad, you're homozygous in that area. If you have a different copy from your mom than you got from your dad, you're heterozygous for that gene. So basically what that means, uh, as an example, remember we have two alleles for haptoglobin that we were looking at, haptoglobin 1 and haptoglobin 2. If you're homozygous, you're haptoglobin 2,2, two, two, or you can be homozygous haptoglobin 1,1. One, one. Haptoglobin 1,2 one, or 2,1 is the heterozygous state. So, we did mention SNPs a couple of times. A SNP is sort of like a, it stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. That's a, again, a long, ugly word. Uh, it just, uh, people think of it as a mutation. The reason the scientists don't call it a mutation is mutation uh, implies that it happened and mutated now uh, in that individual, and that's not usually the case. A lot of these are just stable variations. So a SNP is more like a variation. Um, <clears throat> we'll mention terms like genome-wide association study later. Those are becoming very important in helping us do things like understand where the genes come from that cause uh, problems, like uh, the inherited diseases, uh, problems with blood pressure, uh, tons and tons of things. Again, most of the books uh, of medicine right now are being rewritten because of genetics and the genome-wide association studies are driving that. Now let's get away from the generic genetics for a minute and review what we talked about. Uh, and again we talked about stuff that we can impact on a daily basis because uh, you can. You can overcome your genes. Uh, you can't change your genes uh, but you can overcome them. If you don't believe that, look at, see my video on my uh, arterial age. Two years ago, my arterial age was that of a 73-year-old uh, man, and uh, last month it was that of a 52-year-old, just by changing some things that, uh, that we know to change. So we covered 9P21. That was one of the first things we covered. Um, that is the gene that's referred to in the the title of the book by Brad Bale and Amy, Do Amy Donine, Beat the Heart Attack Gene. Now, <clears throat> you remember starting with the term uh, chromosomes, like you get one chromosome from your uh, mom and then you get another chromosome from your dad. Um, you got 23 chromosomes. Well, 9P21 means chromosome number 9 plus the location, P21. Um, 
We didn't talk about KIF-6. We're not really going to. Um, we used to look at KIF-6 in terms of uh, some risk for heart attack and stroke, um, but we also used it on a practical basis for selection of statins. Since uh, Crestor has lost its patent and is becoming more affordable, low-dose Crestor is great for um, for inflammation. It doesn't low-dose Crestor doesn't increase diabetes, so a lot of the selection and decision-making process is not so difficult anymore for stats when you need to use them. For Q25, remember that's chromosome number four, the Q25 um, location. That's the atrial fib gene. We haven't done a video yet on that, but we will. Now, uh, the two that are really actionable on a daily basis are APOE and haptoglobin. First, we'll talk about haptoglobin 2 again. Real quick, we'll review that. Um, if you look here, you remember haptoglobin 2 is a big deal for diabetics. Uh, if you have haptoglobin 2, 2 and you're a diabetic, you tend to have events carrying your population down this risk curve much quicker than haptoglobin 1, 1 or haptoglobin 1, 2. But there's a fairly simple and easy way to avoid that, vitamin E and keeping your diabetes in control with a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 or less. We talked about haptoglobin 2 in diabetics and then we talked about, you know what? Haptoglobin 2 has impact for more than just diabetics. Zonulin is the precursor molecule for haptoglobin 2 too. And it has been linked with such surprising diseases as leaky gut, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, ulcerative colitis, cancers, again, several different inflammatory-based uh, diseases. So the remember we talked about the solution to that? Another trend. You know, there's been a trend of diagnosing people with leaky gut. I was originally skeptical of that until this science came out. There's also been a trend of gluten-free diet. Well, the gluten-free diet actually does help avoid the problems associated with leaky gut. And how does it do that? Well, it turns out that <clears throat> gluten impacts receptors on the cell in the intestine. Those receptors cause um, haptoglobin 2 or zonulin to be released. When they do, those, uh, that zonulin will uh, impact the tight junctions between cells, allowing uh, foreign bodies into the, between the uh, tight junctions of cells in the gut. Now, that gets us through haptoglobin 2.2. You remember we also talked about APOE. The APOE4 community has been developed because of the uh, huge increase in risk for dementia if you have APOE4.4. You remember we also talked about the daily impact on diet for APOE4.4 versus APOE2.2. With an APOE2.2 individual, uh, tolerating higher uh, calories in fats. Whereas an APOE4 individual has to have lower calories in fats, 20% or less, whereas APOE2.2 can tolerate 30% or less. Then we talked about the fact that, again, it's always something uh, Mediterranean diet is always the go-to go diet for uh, minimizing heart attack and stroke risk. But then you start thinking about things. It's a plant-based diet. Again, very good, uh, good for you for the most part until you hit your 50s and 60s and you start getting insulin resistant. Once you start getting insulin resistance, um, animal fats become, they're still a problem but they become less of a problem than things that have sugar in them uh, and carbohydrates. Remember, if you have haptoglobin 2.2, 2, you want to avoid uh, gluten, which you see in bread and pasta. 
If you have ApoE4, you want to avoid alcohol. So, again, as, it, as we get older, things just get more difficult. Thank you.